time now for my perspective guest, and today it's the Iranian-American novelist, essayist and short story writer Dina Nanieri. Her debut novel, A Teaspoon of Earth and Sea, in 2013, was translated into no fewer than 14 languages. Her second, Refuge, a semi-autobiographical work, was a New York Times uh, editor's choice, but she's here to talk about her latest work and, and first leap by understanding into non-fiction, The uh, Ungrateful Refugee. Dina Nanieri, thanks very much uh, for coming on. Tell us about, about your, your, your latest work. Um, well, as you said, it's my first work of nonfiction. It's, um, I guess, an attempt to make sense of what's going on in the world now after I became a mother and after three decades of, you know, living, I suppose, as a former refugee and with the, um, you know, the traumas of those two years of trying to, you know, I guess, make it to the U.S. Um, I have spent so many years veiling it in fiction, and I, I enjoyed that very much. It's it's the, the form and the craft that I enjoy the most, but... Um, with everything that happened in the world around 2015 and 2016 and, um, you know, my own entry into motherhood, I felt the need to say something more urgently, more precisely, um, just as myself. And tell us a little bit more about your, your own exodus, your experience. Sure. Um, well, I was born in Iran right around the time of the revolution. I was there all through the eight years of the Iran-Iraq war. And, um, you know, my family uh, had gotten into a lot of trouble. My mother became a Christian around the time I was five. And then she was openly proselytizing, talking to, um, you know, people about her new faith. And she got into trouble. So we had to escape the country. And, and then, um, you know, I was also actually um, attending a, an Islamic Republic school under the veil. I um, had a lot of trouble myself, you know, um, and um, we escaped. We went to uh, Dubai, where we were undocumented immigrants. And then after a couple of months, um, after about 10 months, we were taken to a refugee camp in Italy by UNHCR. And tell us about your first experiences in the, in the US. Well, <laughs> you know, after almost two years um, spent trying to learn English, trying to understand the culture I would be entering, because we were applying to English-speaking countries, um, you know, we had... I suppose we had a lot of hope. We had a lot of um, feeling that we ha would soon find a home, that we now spoke the language a little bit and, and would be welcomed, especially as Christians. And um, when we arrived in the U.S., it, it felt very different. We were in Oklahoma, you know, in the middle of middle America, in, place, in a place where they hadn't really encountered many people from the Middle East uh, right around the time of the first Iraq war. And, um, you know, it was a little bit brutal. I think what my mother experienced was a lot of professional hostility, you know, as a doctor from Iran, and, you know, a lot of requests for her story to be kind of offered up to them in its skeleton form, you know, the story of being saved by, you know, the benevolent Americans and all of that. And of course, I went through a ton of just bullying and um, lack of acceptance by the American children. It was a very difficult few years before we learned to be or to show ourselves to be American. And I guess that's reflected in, in the title of your book, the idea that there's this narrative that refugees should be grateful the yes. fact that everybody everybody loves these kind of you know um, success stories that get posted on social media yes. of uh, somebody coming from nothing and, and making their life somewhere else but you're saying it's a lot more a lot more complicated than that. Yeah, That's but, well, not a narrative think, we should be focusing on. Exactly. I, I think what people crave isn't necessarily a story of somebody becoming their fully realized self. Um, you know, in, in fiction, we say that that's the aim, you know, to make your characters fully realized as who they really are. I think what people crave is for refugees to become them. You know, to the success story isn't that they have fulfilled their potential, it is that they've become American or that they've become them. That's, that's what I experienced anyway. And in the title of the book, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that we are grateful. We do love our country. We love it so much more than you could ever imagine considering all that it took to get there. Um, and but that gratitude is private. It can't be channeled. It can't be, you know, um, forced. And and it's it's something that I suppose we need to survive. But it's not something that should be um, postured for the benefit of the native born. And I think when we see that being asked of us, it's a feeling very much like if you are asked to, you know, love someone that you you know you don't want to show love toward or you know any kind of emotion. It's 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 supposed to be freely given and it will be freely given and that's the thing that I'm arguing for. You have experiences either as or of the, the refugee experience in, in several countries. How do they compare? 
Or you mean just um, as, as a witness? As, 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 as you. Yeah. As me. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I have um, moved a lot and I have resettled a lot and started over. In fact, I've just done that two days ago. I just moved to Paris. Um, oh, right. Okay. Yes, which is why I can be here with you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, I think I've become a bit of a chameleon and a bit of a nomad. And I think that experience as a child um, makes you able to do that. And it makes you crave resettlement a little bit and, and starting over. Um, one of the skills that immigrants and refugees, especially childhood ones, pick up is the ability to remake themselves and um, to very quickly adapt. And um, I think I've made use of that in, in order to un try to understand the world. That's what I do as a writer. That's what I do as a person constantly moving. That's you, what I hope I can give to my daughter. You've spoken about how you think the world is regressing. Yes. Oh, my gosh. You know, um, when I arrived in America in the 1980s, in 1989, um, people's attitudes, their sense of duty felt very much different. I think they, um, they understood the, you know, I guess, there was a sense of American duty to take in the world's outcasts. And it was something that happened, you know, started after World War II. America was this champion of the downtrodden, of, you know, people who had been wronged. Um, and we felt that even in the people who didn't personally want us there, um, the country had a duty, the state had a duty. When we had our citizenship ceremony, it was on a huge football field in grand Oklahoma style with hundreds of other new immigrants who were welcomed into the country by the community, if not by every individual. And I think that's a distinction that matters. Now the world has gone to a place where there is a forum and a public place for hostile people to say, no, go back home. You are not one of us. You are not entitled to this life. And it makes me want to say, why? You know, you are the beneficiary of an accident of birth. You are a lucky, lucky person who was born in a place where you can have lots of opportunity. If someone wasn't born into that situation, why, why should they not be allowed to seek it? Why shouldn't they not be applauded for wanting to be your neighbor to make the best of their life? Um, I, I'm shocked by the way the conversation is turning. We should be moving on to more... Um, um, more nuanced and complicated questions of how to welcome people, how to make use of their talents, how to help them thrive, how to remake our communities into, you know, um, multicultural, global places where, um, you know, we're, we're ready for the future, for a world of different types of people. You've just moved from uh, a city which liked to brand itself and still does like to brand itself uh, that way, uh, London. Did you see during the, the time you were there, did you see attitudes changing, the public discourse changing? I think one thing that was really um, hopeful for me and encouraging was that while the populists were talking about, oh, we can be global even if we push out all of the immigrants, the people were taking, um, you know, kind of a different message to heart. I think that people understood their own duty, especially in London, to to welcome migrants and to um, to make use of their talents. And we saw that in things like Refugee Week, you know, doubling, I think doubling, tripling in size in the last couple of years. We saw it in all of the protests and in the many, many, many charities that people just started on their own because they saw a need. You know, for example, I was involved with this charity called Refugee Support, where these two men had decided, you know, they're going to set up grocery stores in refugee camps so that people can shop with dignity. I um, became a board member for one called Host Nation that was pairing up, um, you know, Londoners with with newcomers and refugees and immigrants so that they could be friends, but not just friends wherein one is doing some kind of charity for the other, friends chosen based on age, based on interest, based on location, so that they can start on the same footing. And that's so, so important for people's dignity, self, sense of self, their ability to find a purpose and a place in the community. So, you know, London, actually, the individual people and in the, the communities that makes it up, it, it, it moved me, it made me think they are stepping up, you know, and they I do have a different attitude than maybe the government right now. <laughs> Dina and Yeri, that's all we have time for. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you for having me.